Hello and welcome back to Talk of Fame Podcast. We're your host, Kai Martini. Join us today on the Talk of Fame Podcast. We have casting director, author of The Great Daddy Hunt, owner of the bikini company called The Boyfriend Bikini, and the host of the Strictly Stalking in the Last Year Podcast, Jamie Vivi. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm super excited to have you on the podcast. It's such a pleasure. And how are you today, especially? How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Of course. So, like, I like I know a lot of people know you as a casting director. I know you've been doing this for a couple of years now. Like, how did you kind of discover, like, people as a casting director? I know a lot of people don't know how, like, casting directors really discover people. But, like, on your end, like, how do you, like, discover people as a casting director for, like, entertainment purposes? Well, you know, most people I get through agents and managers. So when I get a project, the producers kind of, we talk about what we, what they need, the characters they're looking for, the type of people that they want. Um, And then usually I put a a breakdown um, on a website uh, that kind of everybody uses. Um, And then agents and managers will go through and submit the people that seem to fit for what I'm looking for. And then I'll also call a lot of agents and managers that I know that I have personal relationships with and see who might be available for the role and who they think might fit well for the role. And then from there, um, we either get self tapes or we do auditions and then keep narrowing it down until we choose the right person. Mm-hmm. I guess also is a process like very like hard to do like when you're choosing roles because I know like for me, if I had to choose this one person, it's just like, I can't just choose one person. I have to choose multiple people. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be really hard. Um, Sometimes, you know, just the right person just floats up to the top and it's an easier choice. Um, But, you know, a lot goes into it. And there's a lot of people that help make that choice. The producers, the director, um, you know, myself, the casting director, everybody kind of puts that choice together. So Usually, we can all agree and, and narrow it down pretty quickly. Mm, and who plays, like, a valid role? Like, is, is this, like, the casting director that does all the work? Is it, like, or is it, like, the director, a producer, or is, like, the whole cast? Um, It's everybody. It's everybody. Um, You know, I, I kind of do the beginning stages myself, usually, Um, you know, finding who I think is would be a good fit for the role. And then, um, you know, I'll get all the tape, the self-tapes, or I'll do the auditions and tape those, and I'll go through that. And pick the best ones. And that's who I send over to the director and the producers. And then from there, we usually discuss it for a little while. And sometimes we, you know, do a callback where um, the director and producers can get to know the actor. Um, And sometimes, you know, we just see the right person and bam, you know, that's that's the person. And we go from there. Mm -hmm. Like it seems like sometimes it's like an easy process, like sometimes like easy, sometimes it's hard, depending on the role. And I know like yeah. with everything, it's very like different from like the last one you did. Yeah, everything is really different. I, I definitely never get bored. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's you know, different roles, different types of people, different characters every time. Um, And, you know, sometimes it is kind of easy, I guess. It it took a long time to get to this point Um, where, you know, I kind of know a lot of times when I read a script, who pops in the mind, you know, people I've worked with before or um, people who've auditioned t- for me before that I'm like, oh, this person would be great for that role, you know, so I'll call them up and, and get a tape from them. Um, and so I think like through the years, I've kind of honed in on how to do it, you know, the most concise way possible. Mm-hmm. And the good thing about being a casting director is that like, it keeps you busy all the time. Like it keeps you busy, never get bored of it. it it's like if you want to do something, it's like, oh, I'm just going to do my casting director work. It's always like that's something to do when you're on your free time and stuff. That's true. It does definitely keep me very busy. Um, You know, there's always tapes to watch. There's always new actors coming on the scene to me. Um, You know, a lot of agents and managers, when they sign someone new, they'll send me all their new people and, and, you know, their reels and stuff so I can check them out. And that way it's fresh in my mind when I have a project coming up and I'll, I'll think about that person, you know? So yeah, it's, it definitely keeps me busy. Exactly. And like, like, were you a production manager before you became a casting director? I was, that was kind of my first introduction uh, into the industry. Um, I had a, a friend who wanted to be a director and have a production company 
And it was just kind of me and him. And he said, oh, well, you can manage the production company. And I was like, well, I don't know how to do that because I've never even been on a set, uh, you know. Um, but luckily, this day and age, everything is online. Everything you need to learn is online. And, you know, I just <laughs> started off Googling everything. And it's also about who you hire. Um, you know, I, I hired the right lighting people, the right camera people. Um, and I think that's a really important aspect of being in charge of something is hiring the right people around you. Um, mm -hmm. You never want to try and do everything yourself. If you can hire somebody else that knows more than you, uh, it's a great way to learn. And so that's kind of how I how I started into it. But one of the jobs that I did do myself uh, while I was um, working with that company was all the casting. So it was kind of an easy transition to go from that into casting. I, I loved the casting aspects of things. Um, you know, I kind of get to spread good news and tell everyone, hey, you got the job, you know, congrats. And I get to meet a lot of people. So it seemed like the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. Like I know like with being a production manager and doing casting, it seems like like you basically already know like what to kind of do in terms of like making that transition to being a casting director. Like, of course, there's still things to learn, but then you still have a lot of details in mind and what to do in that position now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it was a pretty um a pretty good transition into that. And I I got the opportunity to kind of, you know, make some mistakes along the way and, and learn that way, which I think was, you know, is great. Um, you can learn a lot uh, reading and online and, and from people, but actually doing it really, it, it helps. <laughs> it helps yeah, to actually do it and make those mistakes and, and learn from it that way. Yeah, and like that's what the best thing about YouTube and everything is for. And so like when we don't want to like spend money on things, which I hate spending money on unless it's like a good cause and I'll make it a session. But like if it's something for like, a job, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to go to YouTube because YouTube or the Internet is like the best thing that ever happened to me in terms of like having a job and trying to figure out what to do. Totally. Totally. It's it's so easy. You know, when I I'm much older than you, but when I first, um, you know, started out, there was no Internet or Wi-Fi yeah. or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I remember when the first cell phones came out and they were not what they are now. Um, mm. And I think that, you know, there's so much available at our fingertips now to just learn and, you know, and learn for free, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So like I just like. I, like, have no idea how, like, kind of people did it, like, when they didn't have cell phones, so, because, like, it's, like, of course, like, you want to learn, but then, like, you, technology wasn't a big thing, like, years ago in the early 2000s, late 90s, it wasn't a big thing, especially in entertainment, like, you need to actually have people that actually sign and like, self-taste or anything back then, it was always in-person auditions, so, like, I'm, like, how am I that I think myself, how am I supposed to live in the nineties if there's no technology? And I'm like that's true. I seem like oh I'm a technology nerd, which I'm not, by the way. Um but it's, it might seem like everything revolves about technology nowadays, but it's like, you know, like technology can be good and bad, but like with needing help with things, technology can be very good for that. Yeah, I mean it's definitely changed my job um with casting. I mean, we used to have paper copies of resumes and paper you know their photos like copies of their photos and you know everybody had to show up for the auditions and I think that you know it with self-tapes and everything being online I mean obviously it's I think it's a little better for the environment <laughs> you know we're not yeah. printing everything off um but also I think it's great for time for time management um you know people don't have to drive around town, you know, LA is a big city, New York is a big city, you have to mm -hmm. go all around town to all these different auditions and things. And, you know, it's not, there are some things that that we lose with that. And that oh my dog, and that's just like the personal aspect, you know, of like meeting people in person and stuff. But, you know, with Zoom and, you know, FaceTime type of things, um, we can kind of overcome that. But mm -hmm. overall, I think, you know, technology has really helped out the industry a lot. Mm -hmm. And like, like, do, wasn't the change like, difficult for you when you went from like production manager to casting director? Or was it kind of like a smooth type of like thing to kind of transition? Because I know you had some experience with casting and stuff before. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was pretty smooth because I think I was just... um 
like I naturally gravitated toward the casting. Um, I really liked it. And if I like something, I'm like all in, you know? Yeah. Um, and when I was, you know, working in production and management, um, I was able to meet a lot of agents and managers that way. So that really helped with the seamless move over into casting because that's kind of the number one thing, you know, it's, it's true. It is in who, you know, and, and who knows you um, in order to get, emails responded to and you know to for people to take phone calls and and things like that mm, that's the best thing about this industry is that like you make connections all over like you meet people that you may know and like connections every person will probably have a project that is like for you and that's the best part about this is like you always know so I'm fit for something oh yeah for sure definitely and like you are the owner of a bikini company called The Boyfriend Bikini, which is about personal growth, finding inner peace, claiming your true happiness and being a boss. Like I absolutely love the mission. Like how does your brand channel like personal growth and like mental health? Well, you know, so I, um, it kind of all ties in randomly um, with a lot of the other things I'm doing in life. I was in a very toxic um, relationship for a long time, unfortunately. And when I finally got out, you know, I realized that I'm not the only girl that's been in, you know, a horrible relationship like that. Um, but it was really hard to not only get out, but then to rebuild my life after that. And so one of the things that I always wanted to do was kind of like have my own bikini company. And um, in rebuilding my life after that relationship, I started traveling more and I, I traveled by myself. I've traveled the entire world by myself and I've gone to, you know, I don't 45 countries alone. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and it was really scary at first. It, it was terrifying, mm -hmm. but um, I wanted to do it. You know, plenty of people do it. I can do it too. And I think like, that growth of like starting to do things on my own and realizing that I do have that confidence, you know, and that I can do things after, especially after being shut down so much in such a bad relationship. Um, but I realized, you know, I'm not the only, I'm one in a million women who have to go through this. Um, you know, a lot of people are in abusive, horrible relationships and things like that. So, you know, in doing all that, one day I was like, okay, like today's the day I'm going to do this bikini company. And I did. And so part of the proceeds goes to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, because, um, you know, that was, you know, it's a, it's a big thing that, that I dealt with and a lot of women deal with. And I think, you know, that really spurs like the growth and, and it, it's hard to get out of those relationships. So, you know, the other part of the bikini company is just like, you know, not, not just having, you know, learning that confidence, getting that growth, but um, once the company grows, you, the company itself starts growing, what I really like to do is um, kind of franchise it so that women that are coming out of shelters after being in, you know, a domestic violence situation, um, they can, you know, take a portion of the company and and sell their own bikinis, you know, and that way they don't have to put the money out, you know, they'd be selling and, and getting a portion of the proceeds for themselves. Because it's really hard and a lot of women end up going back to their really prior relationship when they leave these shelters, because they don't have anything, they might not have a place to live, they don't have money for food, they don't, you know, they might have kids, it's, it's really hard to get back on your feet. So I'm hoping in the long run that this company can help other women you know, get that confidence back, get back on their feet, um, you know, financially, personally, um, and things like that. Well, oh, that's amazing. Like, your company is definitely making an impact for sure. Like, it's just like, I know people that dealt with toxic relationships. And like, what ha I have seen, like, it's just like, it's very hard. Like, I can tell, like, by people, like, social media is not about like, because I know a lot of people through social media think like, oh, I want this relationship. Like, oh, he seems so happy. I can have a relationship like that. But then, like, social media, you do not know what's going on behind the scenes of that picture. Exactly. Like, they could it's easily, let's just say, be fighting. Like, you do not know what's going on behind the picture. You might just be smiling, get out of the picture, just frowning. You know I mean? I mean? That's so true. That's so true. Like, I, I used to post pictures of me and my ex all the time. Like, 
I would do hashtag best boyfriend ever. And no one knew that I had been crying 10 minutes before that picture was taken, you know, or he was yelling at me 10 minutes before, you know. So it's like what we portray on social media is is not real life. And that's fine. But I think um, especially sometimes with 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 anybody, like it's hard to to see all these great things that are happening all day long on social media. And you think that's what's happening. And then your life is kind of like a mess. You know, your yeah. life is a runaway train or you think so. And then everyone else is doing so great, but really it's, it's not like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure how to change the narrative on that. Um, you know, I don't think that people need to put everything that's terrible about their lives on social media either. I, mm-hmm. I just think that it, it needs to come from an internal place where you need to realize that, you know, you're putting your best foot forward on social media. So is everybody else, you know? So everybody has bad days. Everybody has bad relationships, you know? everyone's going through something, but we just don't see it on social media. So yeah, Mm -hmm. like you don't really know what's happening with people. Yeah. And like with people being in toxic relationships, like with with them like getting out of it, like you, it's just like, I like applaud you and everyone else for getting out of it because I know like it can be very hard and especially exhausting to try to get out of it because you don't know how the other person is going to react in that situation. Like you don't know like what's going to happen. So it's just like, I know it can be very hard to be in that situation. Like, because I know like a lot of people, especially with social media, like you said, pe- people can see a picture and be like, oh my God, like they're so happy. I'm happy for that person. You may never know. You may actually be happy in that picture and all these things. You may never know. But it's like, so you may never know what happened 10 minutes before that t- picture was taken. Like I took That's a so million true. pictures before and I was miserable and having a bad day before the picture was p- taken and p- posted on social media. Like, you just do not know what, like, people are going through. Like, I, like, but sometimes I'm like, you might see that picture of these people happy and having fun, like, going traveling and all these things, but, but they might actually have a reason for that. Like, like for me, like, traveling is an escape from reality. Like, it's just, like, an escape from what I'm going through and have, a, like, a, such a relief for a couple of days and have fun for, for myself, not for anyone else but me. Mm hmm. Yeah. And and you know what you said about when people leave a toxic relationship um, is one of the most dangerous times, because, you mm-hmm. know, especially if it is an abusive relationship, that's when, you know, your abuser thinks that there's nothing left to lose. And, you know, a lot of women do get seriously hurt or, you know, murdered at that point you know in yeah. from an abusive relationship is when they leave and I think that's one of the reasons it's so hard for women to leave an abusive relationship um and that's why you know supporting the women's shelters and the national coalition against domestic violence is really important because it does take money to leave those relationships a lot mm-hmm. of times the women in those relationships are controlled by finances you know maybe they're not allowed to work or the other person is taking all their money. They they literally have nothing at that point. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, not only is it dangerous, but it's hard to leave, you know? Yeah, yeah it's very hard. And I know, like, I don't know if you know this foundation, but it's like, it was um the Joyful Heart Foundation by, that was founded years ago by Mariska Hante is really founded for domestic violence and mm-hmm. all these things which I love because, like, not there's not a lot of organizations that kind of that's mission is about domestic violence and it's kind of the reality about it because like yeah. I, like because like when you leave a domestic violent relationship or abusive or toxic or whatever like it, like whatever you guys want to call it is um it can be very hard mentally physically and like it might it's very draining like even like like you can drain all your mentally, you make you tired. All you want to do is sleep. Like I with me, like whenever I'm upset and not miserable, I'm like, I just want to sleep. Like it's just like I don't know why, but I'm the person that loves to sleep. I don't know why, but it's a little, it's a kind of like a bad habit. But it's like whenever you're going through that hard time, like you probably want giving the money away to that person, or you don't have any food, and you have to live out maybe sometime on the street, or whatever the situation may be, it's going to be hard after. Because like sometimes you, like, you do not know where your life is going to be like after you leave. 
it's not it's just so used to being with that person that you're like yeah what am I supposed to do with myself without that person being my life even though it's the best decision for yourself and your well-being you just don't know how to live after well yeah and you know a lot of those times a lot of the times those types of relationships become very addictive because the abusers um you know, they, they put it, they get it into the cycle where they're going to be so nice. They're going to get flowers. Everything is great. They're affectionate and wonderful and telling you these nice things for like a certain amount of time. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you get used to that, you know, you get addicted to that feeling and then, um, you know, something happens usually in their own personal lives has nothing to do with you. And then that's when the abuse comes back. So it is just that circle of like, nice, 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 you know, and then something will happen. And then it's a beast again. And then so you get used to that. And you wait for those nice times, which, you know, from experience, it becomes less and less, you know, the the bad times will always take over. Um, You know, and what they say, you know, if if somebody hurts you once, they will continue, because the only way not to let that happen is to leave the first time. And but you don't think of that. Um, Mm. You know, I'm I'm a smart girl and and you know I always was like oh if anything I'll leave the first time anyone does anything and I didn't I I stayed for seven years and it's because you know those apologies and oh I'm gonna go get help and I love you so much and I'm so sorry and and so you know you want to believe it so bad that you do and you've already put all this energy into this person because nobody no relationships start out like that you know it's usually mm-hmm. within the first three to six months that, you know, the first incident will happen. And it's hard to leave by that point, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and a lot of people ask, like, well, why didn't you leave? Why didn't you leave? Because it's very, very hard. And you're stuck Mm -hmm. in this cycle. And usually you're isolated from your other friends and family. And so this is the only person that you have. So it's, it is very hard to leave. And, and, you know, so hopefully, with, you know, especially with more technology, and, you know, more, um, things like the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and shelters, we will be able to help more people. Mm, definitely. Like, they, like, with these, like, these resources, like, like I know with these things, like, it's growing over time, especially with our technology, and, like, people deserve to get help, especially with these things. It's, just go- it's happening more and more as time goes by, yeah. and the media, like, doesn't really talk about it. It's never on the news, really. And like, we need, need more people like you to really kind of talk about it. There's not a lot of people really talking about their experiences and open up. It's like, I know with a lot of people like sharing your experiences and their stories can be very hard. Like for me, like sharing my, my story, my experiences with anxiety and depression was a very good call. Because I know like, once you kind of grow that confidence into like talking about what you dealt with, is very strong with the person that's going through that because of course you're helping yourself but you're also helping other people like to speak up and go through the same exact thing yeah and it is really hard to speak up you know for years I I didn't speak up um but you know with my podcast strictly stalking that's kind of another one of those crimes that people don't really talk about is being stalked and so and I for that I interview people I interview survivors of stalking and man, it's hard for them to speak up. And Mm -hmm. a lot of survivors of stalking have also been through domestic violence. So I'm sitting there, you know, I'm hearing their stories week after week. And I'm like, these people are all coming forward and telling me their stories on this platform so we can help other people. I need to be doing the same thing, you know, in my life. I need to tell my story as well. And once I did, you know, once I kind of opened that floodgate and felt okay talking about, you know, what I had been through in that relationship, um, it did feel better because I know that, you know, it is helping other people. Um, And that's why, you know, after I started talking about it, that's kind of why I was like, all right, I'm going to do this bikini company because it is a way that I can at least give money back, um, you know, into the system. And hopefully soon as the company grows, I'll be able to, like I said, kind of franchise that out to other women that are coming out of um, shelters so that they'll have something that can keep them away from that relationship. Mm-hmm. And like, I want to go back to the bikini company. Like, why do you name your company the boy from bikini? Is it all about like, the, or like after being out of a relationship? Or is it like, oh, this is, this is a great name to use this company? So it's funny, I actually wanted to call it um, the ex-boyfriend. I was, you know, I had a lot of anger um, in 
in that relationship. And when I left that relationship, I felt a lot of anger. I was angry at myself for staying so long. I was angry at him for wasting years of my life and and for being abusive, you know, simply. Um, and so I called one of my friends and I was like, I'm going to call it the ex-boyfriend and, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to just, it's going to be mean about him and stuff. My, my girlfriend was like, this is a terrible idea. She's like, why would you build something so great on something so negative, you know, and, and keep that negativity there. And so, you know, I, I thought about it, I'm like, she's right. <laughs> um, so I turned it around and tried to make it uh, into a more positive vibe. So called the boyfriend bikini. And um, each, each like style or color is named after a type of guy. Um, but in a more positive way, like I, you know, I named one after my dad, who's like the best dad in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I named one after my little brother, I named one after some of my amazing exes that I've had that I'm still friends with, you know. Um, and so and then each each one that's ordered, you get kind of the story about that person and the positive impact that they've made. Um, and some of them are more like funny, you know, like or guy friends that I've had um, or like a- about like friends of of or uh, husbands of my friends, you know, that I think are great guys. So it, I wanted to make it more positive and name it after like guys that that because there's plenty of amazing men out there. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to be like. Ah, men are all bad because they're not. They're really not. There's a lot of great, amazing men out there. So I just wanted to put that positive spin on it. Um, you know, because like my girlfriend said, like, why would you build something amazing off of something so negative? And it, it does come from a negative place in my life, but not anymore because I've grown from that. And now I'm trying to help other people from that negativity and turning it into a positive thing. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you kind of like this make it more of a positive rather than negative company? You know, just by by mostly by naming it, um, you know, after men that I think are more positive, you know, I don't want to name one after my horrible ex who was abusive. Like, I don't, you never want to give, um, you know, somebody who is abusive or a narcissist more attention because that's what they thrive on. That's what keeps yeah. them going. Um, so I wanted to take that away and, and kind of give the nice guy the attention, you know, like, you know guys that are friends of mine that are that are great or whatever, you know, kind of name it after that type of guy, you know, I have one called the Mr. Nice Guy, which kind of reminds me of my my business partner. Um, And you know, you get there's a little story about that, like he's he's a great dude, you know, he's um very helpful and wonderful and and um not anyone that I've ever dated or anything, but he's a great business partner. But I just wanted to kind of put that positive vibe, that positive spin on it rather than keeping it a negative thing. Mm-hmm. Because like if people like see like your business off of a positive pushback against men, because a lot of people think like, oh men, they're so stupid, like oh they're rude, everyone's rude. But not everyone, not every single guy is rude. Trust me. I grew up yeah. with two brothers. I obviously have a lot of guys in my family, a lot of guy friends, and like not every guy is horrible. <laughs> Even though That's very true. Guys, but not every guy is um horrible and rude like you might might seem like that just at the time but it's not yeah well and and that's true and that's something that you know when I left that relationship I I didn't date for a long time because you know I was kind of scared of men I'm like all right well I went through that I'm not going through that again um you know and it took me a minute to realize that there's so many wonderful men out there just and and it's more with you know with me my personal boundaries now like I I have some major boundaries you know if if somebody says you know if I'm uh talking to a guy or seeing a guy and and he says something or something that I don't think is appropriate then I'm I'm done you know Mm -hmm. like I can just walk away because I am independent fully independent financially independent confident so I I don't need that anymore Mm, no one deserves that honestly no one deserves that kind of negative feedback and appropriate things no one deserves that ever Exactly. But like, how do you like, do design the products at your company? So I'm sorry, what? How do you uh, design like your products at your company? So I did not know <laughs> when I started. I was like, I just, you know, I knew the type of bikinis that I like, that I like to wear. Um, but I had no idea how to like make a bikini. So I found a girl in Paris who was going to fashion school. 
Uh, I emailed her and I said, Hey, can you help me make a pattern? Uh, this is kind of, I, I sent her a bunch of photos of me in bikinis. And I was like, this is kind of what I wanted to look like, like this top and this one, you know? Um, and she's amazing. So she did make the, the pattern for me. And then I went to Bali, um, in Indonesia and I found a company out there, a manufacturer that I absolutely love because, um, you know, it's very ethically produced at that company. Um, the tailors, they get to, they have a sewing machine that, you know, we get them, they get to work from home, um, which is wonderful because then, you know, they just have a deadline. So it's more like a remote working situation. They can spend time with their family, they, their kids, their friends, you know, they get breaks. They're not in a warehouse, you know, I, I didn't want that. And they're, they're paid um, an adequate amount as well. Um, you know, they're paid well, especially for where they, they live. Um, and because there's no reason to like, not pay people enough, you know, Ooh. like everyone should be having a, a great living wage for what they're doing. Um, and so, yeah, so I just got them manufactured in Bali. I went uh, recently and picked up a shipment, uh, met everybody and it was amazing. Amazing. And like, I want to add, um, you are the host of Strictly Stocking Podcast. Like, do you have a, a stocking story that someone sure does like kind of me for you? Um, you know, there I've done over 200 interviews, um, mm. for the podcast, which is crazy that so many people are being stalked. One that always sticks out in my mind, um, cause it just kind of reminds me of me, I guess, is this woman, she was younger. Uh, she had just moved out of, you know, her parents' house and was going to college. It was like, I think her first year in college. And she was living in this apartment building and, you know, she was going out a lot partying classes, you know, just the full college experience, which I did as well. So th I think that's why it reminds me. I was like, Ooh, great. I'm out of, I'm out of the house, you know, I'm doing everything. Yeah, having fun, and, no yeah. and so no she slowly noticed that things were like moving around in her house and she lived alone. Um, or like eventually she noticed that one day all of her underwear had, had finally gone missing. Like it was a couple at a time here and there. And she'd be like, what did I do with my underwear? You know, which is kind of like me. I don't know if I would notice right away. I'd be like, that's weird. I guess the laundry machine ate my underwear again, you know, not really yeah. thinking about it. Because when you're busy like that too, you don't think like someone's stealing my, all my underwear. But yeah, what had, I would yeah. either. I'd be like, oh, it's just like, it's probably the washing machine. Yeah, no. you know, and, no. I, and I lose things or, you know, whatever. And um, what had happened eventually is that she realized there was actually a man living in the crawl space uh, in her in her place in her apartment watching her um and that's terrifying that is yeah. utterly terrifying and he'd been living there for a while watching her he would come down while she was sleeping um take pictures uh steal her underwear and her things and thank god he got caught before it escalated into, you know, something violent or, you know, kidnapping, who knows what his real plan was. But I just think like, sometimes, especially when you're younger, it's really hard to be aware of what's going on, because so, there's so much happening in your life. And, you know, you have this whole new lifestyle, you just got to college. And, you know, it's, I think things like that have taught me in my life, like, I do need to be aware. And I, I think things like that have to ha have helped me, you know, traveling solo throughout the world because, you know, you really have to be aware <laughs> when you're doing yeah. that, you know, and, and to stay safe. So I think it's important to always, you know, remember that you do have to take kind of a step back once in a while and evaluate what's happening in your life, even, you know, whether you're having a great time or not great time. But I think that step back and evaluating is is really important to make sure that, everything is is going good you know like I kind of imagine how like a soccer living in your place and not noticing like I'll be like what if that if I saw the person I'll be like oh, I'm out of here I'm not coming back ever again like this is honestly horrible I mean well that's the thing like he was hiding up in a crawl space above her closet like she didn't even know that there was a crawl space up there you know there was just like a little um hole out of the ceiling that he could move and come down out of her closet like if I had rented a place, there's no way I would look up in the ceiling at the closet and think, well, I think there's someone could crawl up there. You know, you don't think about that. Yeah, you don't think about it, that, but you think yeah. it's another closet. Yeah. 
you just yeah. don't you just don't know you know yeah, you never know sometimes you just don't have a clue to what is actually happening and and it could happen to anybody mm-hmm. anybody anybody yeah. But like you are the author of the Great Daddy Hunt. Is the cover of your book your dog? It is. So I mean, the book is it's supposed to be funny. Um, it was kind of a, it was a very random experience. I was trying to kind of learn, um, like the AI illustrations and stuff, um, for some other projects, and I started. Uh, I. <laughs> I just started with with the illustrations. I was like, you know, I've already done all these, built all these cool illustrations and whatever, and it's hilarious to me. Um, I'm gonna write a little story to go along with it, and you know, I, I spend like 24 hours a day with my dog, so yeah, I just uh, tried to write this funny little story, and it's it's basically where, you know, I I'm single after the terrible relationship, um, and so it kind of tells a story of that. And how my dog uh, probably should have a daddy because he would probably like one. But it's hard. You know, dating is hard. So he kind of goes throughout the neighborhood and and looks around. He does eventually find some, you know, a nice guy that works at a bookstore and brings him home and uh, and works out happily ever after, which it hasn't in real life yet, but hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Yes, at the home. Is the dog a good retriever? Yes. Really? Yes, his name's Cabo. Like, I would go to interview with myself. They're the best dogs in the world. Like, not gonna lie, I literally begged my parents for years every single <laughs> day for a golden retriever. I, they I are great. For Goldens, I begged them every single day. And I gave them for my birthday a couple years ago. And, like, Goldens are just the best dogs ever exist. Like, so lovable. Like, even though so they're loving. Hyper, and they're very hyper at times, but they're just the, the best dogs ever. Like, my mom claims it's what I think it's one of the best things to ever happen to her. Like definitely, these gardens are just so lovable, and it's like they're very cuddly dogs as well. Like they're very cuddly. Well, depending on the dog, not every garden <laughs> um cuddly. I know a lot of mine dogs. is, mine is. But you know, like it's just like the gardens are just the best dogs in the world. They really are. Yeah, and I just want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're amazing and so inspiring. I appreciate you so much and really appreciate you taking your time. You're amazing. Just keep doing what you're doing. And um, I wish you all the best. See, if you ever need help or anything, feel free to reach out. We have you help you in any, any way I can. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so you much. You too. Bye.